I'm very happy to introduce uh, Mario Livio. Mario is an astrophysicist working in the Hubble Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. He was uh, the head of the science division of this institute. Before going to Baltimore, uh, Mario explored all of the Israeli academic institutes. He did his undergraduate studies in uh, Hebrew University, mathematics and physics. Then came, then came for his master degree at Weizmann, doing it in uh, particle physics his PhD in Tel Aviv University in astrophysics, and finally became a professor uh, in the Technion. So he knows everything about all the Israeli institutes. Uh, he's doing uh, research uh, in astrophysics and uh, mainly explosions of supernova, and uh, they're used to measure the expansion rate uh, of the universe. Uh, I have to say, personally, whatever Wikipedia or his own, own homepage say about his biography, for me, the most important item there was that he was uh, my physics uh, teacher in high school in Tel Aviv. <laughs> and he's very much to blame for the fact that uh, I chose physics, or, uh, or to give the credit that I chose physics as a career. He was a wonderful teacher and played basketball with the students uh, in the breaks, which is a bit unusual. Uh, so, and then I met him uh, as a lecturer in the Technion when I came to do there my undergraduate, as did uh, Daniel Zeifman and Joel Zeifman and others from uh, this institute. So he's uh, many people here uh, owe him our uh, start, at least uh, in the physics. Uh, in recent years, he's also uh, focused or part-time uh, wrote uh, several five uh, popular science uh, books, which uh, have all been uh, a huge success, bestsellers, excellent uh, reviews. And the last of them is called uh, Brilliant Blunders. It came out this year. And as the previous books, it's highly successful was already uh, translated uh, into Hebrew uh, under the name Shgiot uh, Geoniot, uh, which we thought that Fashlot uh, Mefuarot would have been a better name for it, <laughs> but somehow that was not accepted uh, by the publisher. And uh, he will tell us what the book is about. So Mario, please. Thank you very much, Yossi. It's always a pleasure to be back here. It's an institute that I really appreciate and love very much. And I want to tell you a little bit about this uh, particular topic and book. Um, so just a few words to begin with uh, to tell you about the book itself and how, how it happened and so on. Uh, while I was writing it, people were continuously asking me, what is your book about? And I used to say, it's about blunders, and it's not an autobiography. Uh, uh, I, I chose five giant scientists, and here I'll only talk about three, but there are five, uh, all great luminaries. Uh, and for each one of them, I selected one major blunder that they have made, and I analyzed those blunders to death. And, and I'll say a little bit more towards the end as to why I chose this particular topic. Uh, but at this point, let me just say that, uh, first of all, it's comforting to the rest of us that even such luminaries made giant blunders. I mean, you know. It's not just us who make those. Um, uh, how did I choose those five? This is a question that I'm often asked. Uh, so I'll just say that um, first, I wanted them all to be really great scientists. And I not, don't mean just good scientists, but truly great scientists. Uh, the second thing, I didn't want to go very, very far into the past. Because if you go far enough into the past, then you find out that almost everything they did was a blunder. Like, you know, if you go to Aristotle, Aristotle, essentially everything he said in physics was wrong, uh, which doesn't diminish anything from the greatness of Aristotle. It's just that you went too far. So I only went to the middle of the 19th century uh, because of that. Uh, there is also a thread that goes through all the five scientists that I discussed, and that's the thread of evolution. And by that I mean evolution of life on Earth, evolution of the Earth itself, evolution of stars, and evolution of the universe as a whole. Um, so with this, uh, with this introduction, let me start and say that the first thing you notice if you are not a professional about life on Earth is the incredible diversity of life. I mean, you know, here are just a few examples of the so many things that you see with life. You know, you see things going all the way up to 30,000 feet and things going all the way down in the sea to 30,000 feet under the, the, the sea and so on. Uh, nobody knows, actually, with certainty how many species there are on Earth, but the latest sort of serious estimate puts it at 8.7 million. Uh, but numbers could perhaps go even as high as, as 100 
million, we, we don't really know, but it, it's certainly in the, in the many millions uh, that we have species on Earth. The second thing that we see on, uh, with, about life on Earth is the, the enormous degree of adaptation and also these kinds of symbiosis, this sort of scratch my back and I'll scratch yours type relationship where, you, you know, I mean, the, 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 if you look at the bumblebee, I don't know, you know, its size is precisely such that it fits into the flower on which it feeds. And then, you know, its body gets polluted, you know, from all these things and it transfers these to other flowers and so on and so forth. Uh, this particular uh, clownfish here, I mean, lives among these uh, poisonous tentacles of this particular sea anemone. And, uh, you know, the, the, the fish protects the anemone, or the anemone protects the fish. The fish itself is covered with a special mucus, which protects it against the poisonous tentacles of its own host, and so on. So, so there is this enormous degree of, of uh, uh, symbiosis and, and adaptation. Now, it was these two elements, uh, the huge diversity and the incredible degree of ad adaptation and symbiosis that convinced many, many naturalists over centuries that uh, there had to be some sort of a guiding hand, a designer, or whatnot, and so on. And all of this, of course, changed uh, with one person, which was this person, Charles Darwin, here at old age. Uh, I like this particular picture. And here is uh, the, you know, a copy of the first uh, book that came, you know, on the origin of species by means of natural selection, which appeared in 1859. And with one blow, uh, Darwin changed our entire ideas of how life on Earth uh, evolved and, you know, and developed and, and almost everything that has to do with life on Earth. Uh, I put this uh, diagram here not because it is accurate, which it isn't, but because from a graphics design perspective, I thought it's very, very appealing. Uh, it's very pretty. I have a friend here who is an artist, and uh, maybe she'll appreciate it. Um, uh, the reason I say it's not exactly accurate, uh, in, in fact, far from accurate, is that it kind of gives you the impression that uh, this is at the top, uh, in some sense, of creation. Uh, and, you know, as... Uh, uh, many people have pointed out evolution is not like a ladder, it's more like a bush. Namely, things evolve in many direction, directions and many things that are, you know, at equidistant from the, the source, you know, they are equally uh, evolved. So it's not that, you know, this is so much more evolved than that and so on. Of course, things that are maybe bacteria here are less perhaps, um, were at least at one time less evolved than here. Now, one thing that's interesting about Darwin, that he never published uh, genealogy trees. He never published them. But uh, in his own notebooks, and you know, this is, is one of them, uh, there is something, by the way, very, uh, uh, to me at least, very appealing about when you write a popular book as opposed to professional work, which is that you, know, you, you get to go to the places uh, where the people worked, and in this particular case, you know, I was there, I was able to touch everything, you know, all those things that Darwin touched. It gives you an incredible feeling. So I, I like this uh, genealogy tree uh, because, you see, it has primates down here and it has men over there. Uh, and like I said, he never published such a, a tree, but, but in, to help his own thought process, he used to uh, draw some of these things. Now, what is this theory that uh, Darwin came up with? So the theory is the theory of evolution by means of natural selection. And that theory sort of rests on four major pillars. And those four major pillars are supported by one grand mechanism. Now, this particular drawing has nothing to do with Darwin's theory of evolution. It's actually a Hindu myth. But I put it there because it has four pillars that support the thing. And they're, they're all supported by one grand mechanism. So I thought it fits for what I want to describe here. And uh, there, there is a story that I like to tell, which is almost certainly apocryphal. Uh, but it's such a good story that you, know, you have to tell it, even though it's really probably not true. And this is that Bertrand Russell once gave a talk and used a figure like this. And some lady asked him, and what does that giant turtle stand on? And he said, on yet another giant turtle. And she said, and what does that giant turtle stand on? She said, 
yet another giant turtle. And she insisted, and on where does that end? And he says, lady, I'm afraid from there it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> uh, uh, now, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful story, probably never happened, but, uh, but it's a good story. Now, what are these four pillars? So first, there is the concept of evolution itself, which says that species did not always exist. The species we see today did not always exist, and species are not immutable. The species we see today evolved from other species. In fact, most of the species that ever existed on Earth actually became extinct. So this notion in itself was a revolution. I mean, it's interesting that the concept of evolution was in itself a, a revolution. Uh, by the way, just as a side remark, uh, in the entire first book, Evolution of Species by Means of Natural Selection, uh, Darwin actually never uses the word evolution, not once. Only at the very end of the book, he uses the word evolved. But never does the word evolution appear in the entire book. The second concept is that of gradualism, which Darwin borrowed from his geologist friend, in particular Lyle, who was a great personal friend. And the idea was that, like in geology, uh, you know, changes happen very gradually and very, very slowly, you know, erosion of the surface and all that and so on. Evolution also happens very, very slowly. That it's not that you can watch one species and see it you know, change or evolve and so on. It is th tens and hundreds of thousands of generations that need to happen uh, for things to actually evolve. The, the third thing is common descent. Namely, Darwin says specifically that all this diversity of life that we see today actually emerged from a particular common descent. Namely, as he, as he says it, life was breathed into one form and from that everything else appeared. And finally, there is speciation. Uh, speciation, which is, well, if all started from one type of species, how is it that we have so many? And the idea is that you have splitting or branching. Namely, various types of species, they split or branch. And he drew this diagram again in his notebooks to show this process. And of course, since at every node you double the number of species, then of course you, you get to very large numbers very, very fast. Now, um, again, I like very much this uh, page from Darwin's notes because look, so he drew this and talks about it. Look what he wrote at the top. He writes, I think. You see, so he was very humble at that stage and uh, thought that, you know, it's, it's just a thought at that stage. Now, as I said, all of this was supported by one grand mechanism, which is that of natural selection. Uh, there is a philosopher at Tufts University uh, by the name of Daniel Dennett who wrote once that he thought that uh, natural selection is the greatest single idea that anybody has ever had. Uh, you know, you may disagree with the extreme nature of this statement, but certainly it was a great idea. Now, the idea itself, when pointed out to you, sounds incredibly simple. And the idea is, that you take a certain species, let's say that certain members of this species have a certain characteristic that gives them a certain advantage, and assume that that characteristic is also inheritable, which is absolutely crucial for this. Then, Darwin says, over the years, the entire population will tend to shift toward that particular characteristic. This is the idea. Now, how does that actually happen? Uh, you know, Darwin himself did not exactly know how it happens, but you know, all this speciation, the way it happens, you know, we, we think today is, uh, you know, you can have, I don't know, a certain herd of buffaloes that live on the dry side of a mountain, and then a few of them wander to the, to the other side, to the wet side, and then, you know, over many, many generations, eventually they de develop into to things that no longer can interbreed, and that we call that already different species. Now, I just want to give a couple of examples of uh, natural selection. So this is a known example uh, that comes from uh, England of the 19th century. There was this 
light-colored peppered moth, which, uh, you know, when the trees were, were um, light in color, look, it camouflages so well that you can actually hardly even see it there. But then, you know, in 1848, there was the Industrial Revolution, and they started to pour enormous amounts of soot into the atmosphere. All the barks of the trees were darkened. And what happened was that the, this light-colored moth became the target for massive predation. And it became almost completely extinct. At the same time, the melanic version of this moth uh, started actually to thrive because of the conditions that were developed. Now, uh, this is actually one example where we actually have seen how green practices help. Uh, namely, they started actually to regulate and put a little bit less of all these soot and so on into the atmosphere. And as a result, actually, this light-colored peppered moth uh, was saved from total extinction. Uh, here on the right, I just have different types of red snakes uh, that, depending on the environment in which they were, uh, they developed colors that actually agree with the environment, even though originally they were this one and the same thing. Now, where is the place where we see natural selection actually happening in the most dramatic place, it's of course with bacteria. Every year in the US, some 23,000 people die because uh, they are infected with bacteria that are resistant to all antibiotics. And I'm sure there are some biologists here who know that unfortunately, you know, in the past two decades, we've only discovered like one uh, new antibiotic. I mean, it, it's very hard to discover new antibiotics. And uh, as a result of this, you know, you have things like MRSA and so on, uh, bacteria that are resistant to many, many, uh, develop uh, resistance to many, many uh, antibiotics and even to all antibiotics. Uh, now, why does that happen, by the way? Uh, the most important reason is not the fact that, uh, even though that contributes some, is not the fact that we tend to stop taking antibiotics after three days when it was prescribed for 10 days, and so on, that also is not a good thing, but that's not the main reason. The main reason is that they feed these antibiotics massively to uh, both cows and uh, chickens, which they, where it uh, promotes growth, and also they grow them in such densely packed situations that they need to give them lots of antibiotics. And you may have heard that actually just 10 days ago, the FDA finally um, has issued some instructions uh, which at, at this point are voluntary and are supposed to be monitored by veterinarians that will limit the use of antibiotics with, uh, with you know, all kinds of animals used for food. Uh, now, why do we see this so much in bacteria, of course? Well, number one, because the populations are humongous, and number two, because they multiply very, very fast. So the entire evolution process is compressed in these types of things. Bottom line is that Darwin came up with a theory that explained essentially everything about life on Earth. So where is the blunder? So the blunder has to do with uh, heredity. Now, Darwin didn't know any genetics, and for that we cannot blame him because nobody knew genetics at the time. Um, so he adopted the theory of genetics that existed then, which was that of blending heredity. I'll explain in a second what that is. Where was the blunder? Darwin's blunder, and it was a very serious one, was in the, in the fact that he did not understand, at least initially, that with this type of theory, natural selection could never have worked at all. Now, what was this blending heredity? The idea was that the characteristics of the male and the female get mixed in the offspring in the same way that you would blend paints or gin and tonic. Um, so this was the idea. Now, Darwin was very weak in mathematics. He adopted this theory, but here is the problem. So let, let me just try to explain the problem. Let me first perhaps say it in words and then you know, just explain it here. Suppose I have a population of, I mean, you remember that what happens is that you have a certain species and you have a few individuals or maybe even just one that has a certain advantage, a characteristic that gives it an advantage. So imagine that you have you know, a population of a million white butterflies 
and one that is black. And the black gives you a certain advantage. Now, what's going to happen in blending heredity? What's going to happen is that the black butterfly will mate with a white butterfly. They will produce a gray butterfly. The gray butterfly will mate with another white butterfly, which will produce a paler shade of gray butterfly, and so on. Black not only will not the population shift towards black, which is what Darwin wanted, but in fact, black will disappear from the population even after one generation. Now, here is how that works. Suppose that, that I have a characteristic which I called capital A here, which gives you the color black. One that I, is lowercase a, which is the color white. What will happen? You get one from the mother, one from the father. They bring together, they form gray. But in blending heredity, the big A and the small A, they don't retain their individuality. They completely blend to form a new type of thing, which is, I called here A1, which is gray. And then the A1 will connect with another one, it gives gray, and so on and so forth. So black completely disappears in this case, and there is no way that natural selection will work. What happens in the real world? In Mendelian genetics, which Gregor Mendel came up with, really, genetics works not like the mixing of paints, more like the shuffling of decks of cards. Namely, if I have a jack, and I play blackjack, and having a jack gives me an advantage, then it doesn't matter how much I shuffle, I still have the jack. That is the idea of you know, modern genetics. And the way it works is, yes, you get the big A, small A, they give gray, but the big A and small A retain their individual existence, so that this one gives a big A, a small A, this one big A, small A, those two give a black AA, a gray and a white. And if black indeed gives you an advantage, then over time the population will shift the black. Now, this mistake was pointed out by an engineer named Fleming Jenkin. And once Darwin heard about this, he became very worried. In fact, oddly enough, even before publishing The Origin of Species, Darwin was already somewhat concerned about the theory of genetic, of blending heredity. And if, for example, in 1857, he wrote once that he believes that propagation by, by true fertilization will turn out to be a sort of mixing and not true fusion. This is even before Origin of Species. Then later, after it was pointed out to him, he also came up with a variety of insights, and one of them is so simple that it is just unbelievable that nobody paid any, atten any attention. In a let letter Darwin wrote to Wallace, who was the other person who came up with, with natural selection, he said, look, every female of the world produces a distinct male and female, and not some intermediate hermaphrodite. So how can it be that it is blending heredity? Now, although he understood the problem, Darwin was, as I pointed out, very weak in mathematics, and he was unable to come with a correct theory. In fact, he came with a completely wrong theory called pangenesis, where he wanted the instructions to go from the body to the cell instead of the other way around and so on. But he understood that there was a problem. Now, there is a little piece of um, history of science uh, which I became very intrigued by and which I want to share with you here, uh, which is the following. There have been no fewer than four books that claimed that when Darwin started coming with all kinds of insights, e even much later than this, about the fact that blending heredity doesn't work, that it wasn't his idea, but rather that he actually read Mendel's paper. Mendel's paper was published in 1865. So four books wrote that that's the case. So I, I became a little bit obsessed with this wanted to find out whether that's true or not. And luckily, Andrew Sclater from the Darwin Project also did some work before me, so I was able to build up on his work. So it turns out the following. Darwin never had in his possession Mendel's paper. Now, this in itself is not surprising. Mendel's paper was published in the, in the bulletin of the Brun Society, which Darwin was not... Um, subscribed to, and that was an obscure journal that, you know, 
very few people knew about. However, it is true that in Darwin's possession at the time of his death, there were two books that mentioned Mendel's experiments. So therefore, you know, those people wrote, aha, he had those books, he read about this, this is what gave him the insights. So, okay, I, I, I looked at those books. In one of the books, Mendel's experiment is, is described so briefly that you can hardly even understand what the experiment was, let alone what the conclusions are. The second book was this book by one Wilhelm Olbers Focke, uh, and this is actually the first page of Darwin's copy of the book. You see he wrote his name here. And uh, indeed, it describes something about Mendel's experiments. I asked, actually, for this book to be brought to me. And this is the book. Do you know where Mendel's experiment is mentioned? It's here, in these uncut pages <laughs> in this book. You may remember that in old books, you had to cut the top, you know, and so Darwin never read this book. He had it, but he never read it. And plus, let me tell you, I now read what is written there. Fouquet himself didn't understand anything from Mendel's experiment. Had Darwin read that, he would not have been illuminated at all. So Darwin didn't know about Mendel. Mendel, by the way, did know about Darwin. Actually had a copy of his book in German. He actually marked lines, and he also wrote texts that are clearly based on Darwin's theory. OK, I'm going now to the second scientist. I said I will describe three here, and that's Linus Pauling. I think that to a community here, uh, I think this is probably a name that many people know much more about than I do, actually. But I will tell you the aspects that I was interested in. So this is Linus Pauling at a relatively young age when he came up with his model, which was called the Alpha Helix, which was a model for the structure of many proteins. Um, I, I just want to show you that uh, Pauling got older but the model remained the same because it was <laughs> the, the correct model. Um, uh, Linus Pauling is the only person, by the way, to have received the Nobel Prize twice just by himself without sharing it with anybody. Now, one was for peace, but the other was for chemistry, and he did not share any of the two with anybody else. He's the only person to have done so. Uh, no doubt one of the greatest chemists of his time. Uh, you know, some may say even maybe the greatest ever. So what is this alpha helix thing? In 1948, um, Pauling started thinking about the structure of proteins. Um, and uh, he was actually sick in Oxford. And uh, he took a piece of paper and he drew this kind of structure. And then for maybe let me say another sentence of this. People who were studying structure of molecules at the time uh, were starting to base their thing mostly on um, X-ray diffraction, Bragg diffraction from these molecules. Namely, you know, you shine X-rays on the molecule, it is scattered in a certain way, and from the peaks of where things are scattered, you try to determine the structure of the molecule. Pauling came to this exactly from the other end. He developed this method where he started from structural chemistry, namely, he started from the building blocks of the molecules he wanted to study, understanding everything about those building blocks, everything about the dimensions, about the orientations, and so on, constructing a model, and then testing the model through the X-ray diffraction. This was his idea. So in this case, he concluded that the carbon, nitrogen, and the four atoms that surround them have all to be coplanar, that they all have to be in one plane. And then he started folding this paper in such a way while keeping those atoms coplanar to try to find the structure. And he eventually came up with this model, which he called the alpha helix. So the model was this complicated uh, uh, helical model here. And he had hydrogen bonds uh, connecting you know, the, the various sides. Uh, hydrogen bonds are, well, again, probably I don't need to say this here, but where two different atoms share this connection to the hydrogen atom. Now, he had this model, and he was very pleased with it. But there was one thing that bothered him, and that was that in his model, the, dif the distance between two turns was 5.4 angstroms, while in the X-ray diffraction images, there was a signature at 5.1 angstroms. Now, you might think, 5.4, 5.1, who cares? It's probably OK. 
Well, Pauline cared. Uh, and not only he cared, but he actually refrained for 13 years from publishing his model. During those 13 years, he asked his assistant, Robert Corey, to do X-ray diffraction uh, experiments with every little piece of this molecule. He also asked Branson and others to actually work on mathematical models to see if he has, had missed any kinds of model that could be other than the alpha helix. In fact, he did come up with one other model, but which he realized couldn't be the model for proteins. Um, so all of this for 13 years, and only after 13 years, he decided that the model he came up with originally was the correct one, and he published it. Now, he then turned his attention to DNA. People were starting to talk about DNA. Now, in 1948, actually before people started talking about uh, DNA, uh, Pauling came up with a very, very important insight. He said, look, if I want a kind of molecule that will be able relatively easily to replicate itself, then it is easiest if this model consists of two complement, precisely complementary parts. So that in that case, if I find half of the molecule, then I can immediately predict what the other half should be. That's what he said, he had this pronouncement in 1948. There was another thing that people knew at the time, and these were the Shargaff rules. These are after chemist Erwin Shargaff. And the idea was the following, you see DNA, basically is made of sugars, phosphates, and four bases. The four bases have these complicated names, but they are known as A, T, C, and G. Two of them are single-ringed, two are double-ringed. What Shargaff discovered was that in any piece of DNA that you take, the number of TAs is equal to the number of Ts, the number of Cs is equal to the number of Gs. And Pauling knew that as well. Now, you will notice that this type of relation, when you have two things that are equal, also is kind of indicative of a structure that is made from two things, right? So all of this information was at Pauling's disposal when he came up with the model. And yet, the model that he came up with was completely crazy. The model had three strands. It was helical, but it had three strands, not two. How do you do complementarity with three, three strands, you know, and so on? Now, why did he come up with three? He had the wrong density, and he thought that, oh, I can fit another strand in there. So he, he did that. It had the phosphates in the middle and the bases outside. And plus, that model had a variety of problems. And here, I'll just show you what it looked like. but this was supposed to talk, and uh, for some reason I don't have the sound. This would be impossible under uh, cellular we don't hear the sound in the... Each phosphate group is negatively charged. And so I, can, I can talk to it, it doesn't matter. I don't know why we don't hear the sound in the auditorium. Well, you hear it from my laptop, but uh, you don't hear it from the, from the thing. Well, let me just say what it says. This was the model with the three strands. It had the phosphates in the middle. The problem pointed out in this particular graph is that the phosphates are negatively charged. And if you condense all the negative charges in the middle of the molecule, these things will repel each other and will drive the structure apart. So it couldn't hold. Now, Pauling said, oh, how does it hold? He, he understood this, but how does it hold? I, I'm putting all kinds of hydrogen bonds to hold it together so that it will not break apart. But guess what? You know, DNA is a nucleic acid, which means when you put it in water, it should release hydrogen. But if the hydrogen is there to hold the whole structure together, how can you release it? So the model even did not obey some basic rules of chemistry. It wasn't even an acid. And this is the greatest chemist of the world saying this. So what happened here? You know, the model built inside out, three strands instead of two, 
not obeying uh, basic rules of chemistry, not obeying Chargaff rules, not obeying his own pronouncement about two complementary parts and so on. What happened? Do you know for how long Pauling worked on his DNA model? For one month. So compared to the 13 years that he worked on the alpha helix, he worked on his triple helix model for the DNA for one month. So you then ask yourself, what's going on here? In particular, you ask, why the rush? Why the forgetfulness? How did he forget about the Chargaff rules, about his own pronouncements about complementarity? And what about some of the rules of basic chemistry? Now, one of the things I have done is to try to understand, get a little bit into the minds of the people that I described to see how did they make this mistake? Why? What was it that drove them to these mistakes? Now, you must understand two things. First, I'm not a psychologist. Second, even if I were, these people are all dead, so I cannot talk to them directly. Uh, now, I did talk to almost everybody who worked with them, you know, and so on. But to them, I cannot. We cannot stick them into a functional MRI machine to see what their brain does, you know, when they do their mistakes and so on. But I still, you know, try to understand what was it that led. So I'll, I'll give you just a flavor here of the answers because it shows you how human even the greatest scientists are. Uh, uh, so, you know, it's more complicated than what I'll say here, but I'm just giving you the taste of it. So first of all, why the rush? Well, guess what? Pauling was very competitive. Uh, now, he didn't know about Watson and Crick. He hardly knew about them. But he did know that both in Cambridge, where Lawrence Bragg was, and in London, where Maurice Wilkins was, they had better X-ray diffraction images of DNA than he had, far better. In fact, he asked for their images, and they refused to give it to him. Why the forgetfulness? How come he forgot about his own pronouncements, about Chargaff rules, and so on? This is very bizarre. Uh, the Chargaff rule is in particular, I, I like. My conclusion is that Pauling forgot about the Chargaff rules simply because he couldn't stand Erwin Chargaff. <laughs> he was once on a boat trip from the US to Europe, and Chargaff was there too. And every time Pauling would get on deck, Chargaff would grab him and start to nudge him about his rules. And Pauling was a very laid-back individual. Erwin Chargaff was a very intense individual. And Pauling just couldn't stand this. So I think, you know, he almost took out of his head everything that had to do with Chargaff. What about basic rules of chemistry? What, Pauling didn't know that this is supposed to be an acid and so on? Of course he knew. But Pauling, I believe here, fell victim to his own previous huge success. You see, in the case of the alpha helix, his original model had a problem in it. But his original model, after all the tests that he had done, he, it proved that his original hunch was correct. And the rest of it, you know, why was that 5.1 instead of 5.4? It turned out to be an artifact of the fact that there were two coils, one within the other, which produced an x-ray artifact. So he thought. That, look, I, if I have the basic model correct, the rest is details, and they will work themselves out eventually. So that's what happened. Now, of course, the correct model was suggested by Watson and Crick. It, of course, only has two strands. It's a double helix. The bases are inside. A connects with T. C connects with G, which immediately explains the Chargaff rules. It is exactly that complementary structure that Pauling thought about and so on, so everything worked out fine. Now, what did Watson and Crick do immediately after they discovered their model? What any two such young people do, they went to the Eagle Pub in Cambridge to have a drink. And there, uh, Francis Crick stood up and said, announced to all the people in the pub, we discovered the secret of life. Uh, this is the place where they did it. There is a plaque on the wall which says that. Uh, Anybody who goes to Cambridge sometimes visits the Eagle pub, not just because of Watson and Creek. It's a very interesting pub. It has, on the ceiling there, it has names of RAF pilots during World War II who wrote their names there and so on. It's, it's a great place to visit. 
Now, I showed you Watson and Crick when they were young and did their work. I showed you Pauling young and old. I'll show you also them old. Uh, Francis Crick has since passed away, unfortunately. Jim Watson is still very much alive and kicking. I actually met with him, and we, we talked on the phone and so on. And of course, they did this, this wonderful work. I put this picture here because it's, uh, it, there are three things that are interesting about it. One is uh, that there are many Nobel laureates in this picture. There is a famous picture from a Solvay conference where you have all these Nobel laureates sitting. In this one too here, here is Pauling, uh, Nobel laureate. Here, here is Watson, here is Crick, here is Maurice Wilkins, uh, here is Max Perutz, here is Lawrence Bragg. Lots of Nobel laureates in this particular picture. This is Robert Corey, who was uh, Pauling's assistant. And there are many other here, Shoemaker and others, Jack Donitz, other people. Now, what, what I find interesting in addition to this, one is that there is only one woman. I certainly hope that at the meeting at the Weizmann Institute on the Structure of Proteins today, uh, the numbers are closer to 50-50 or maybe even in favor of the women. This is Beatrice Magdoff, who worked at the Brooklyn Polytechnic. She is the only woman here. And last thing that I found very impressive in this picture, look, this is a meeting of scientists, yes? Uh, here I am, meeting with scientists, giving a talk. I don't wear a tie. Here, everybody wears a tie. <laughs> Things have changed. Let me go to the third person, which is Albert Einstein. This is the picture of Einstein that I love best because when I don't have a haircut, my hair looks like this. Uh, here is, however, where the similarity ends, yes? I mean, I, I, I like to say that Newton is dead, Einstein is dead, and I also don't feel so well. Uh, uh, now, Einstein, of course, came up with this theory of general relativity, and since I know that there are perhaps some biologists, chemists here who may, maybe are a little bit rusty on their general relativity, I give you a, a one-slide version of general relativity. So here it is. Don't, don't get worried by the equation. I just want to say what is written here. So forget for a moment about this term here. This term here is a term that describes the geometry of space-time. This term here describes the mass and energy contents of the universe. So basically what this equation says is that the geometry of space-time is determined by the mass and energy contents of the universe and that gravity, this is the constant of gravity, gravity is not some mysterious force that acts across distance but rather what happens is that mass warps space in its vicinity. So basically, you know, like when I'm standing on a trampoline I cause it to sag and then things have to move in that curved space. So, so planets around the sun, the sun curves space-time, and planets have to move in the shortest paths in that curved space. Basically, as John Archibald Wheeler once described it, he said uh, that uh, matter tells space how to curve, and curve then tells matter how to move. That's how he described it. So that's the essence of general relativity. Now, as soon as Einstein published this in 1915, by the way, in two years we will celebrate 100 years to GR, um, he realized that, you see, at the time he thought that uh, the universe is static, that nothing moves. There was no evidence for anything moving. So he thought the universe is static, but he understood that there is a problem. Because, look, if everything attracts everything else, then how can it be static? This thing, with this universe would collapse under its own weight. So what did he do? He found a clever way to add this term in. And this term added a repulsive force of gravity such that at every point, the repulsive force of gravity precisely balanced the attractive force. This was his idea. Now, why do I say it's very clever? It's very clever because it was not easy to add terms to general relativity that would still leave the theory with the properties that Einstein wanted for it, namely that it would be covariant, you know, that it would look the same to all observers and all that and so on. 
It was not easy to find how to add such terms. And he found a way to add this term. Now, it turns out that to make the universe static by this term, th this was not a good idea. Because while it was true that everything was balanced precisely, it was really an unstable equilibrium, like you know me trying to, to balance this on here. The slightest perturbation causes it to fall. You can even understand this. You don't need to know GR to understand this. I mean, the force of gravity falls like 1 over the square of the distance. The, the, the repulsive force grows like the distance. So if I take you know, the universe and I give it a perturbation to enlarge it, the repulsive force increases because it grows like the distance. The attractive force decreases, so the thing is going to expand further. So it's actually amazing that one had to wait till 1930 for Eddington to point this out after learning it about this from Lemaitre. But, but in any case, Einstein was very pleased with this term because it did, uh, he thought that he did manage to preserve all the nice qualities of general relativity while making his universe static. What happened then, one, and of course, he, Einstein got very, very famous relatively early, was that these two gentlemen, this is Edwin Hubble, after whom our telescope is named. This is the priest and cosmologist Georges Lemaitre. And they uh, found that our universe actually is not static. It's expanding. Our universe is expanding. And this is Hubble's famous diagram showing this expansion. And then, when Einstein heard this, this happened at the, at the late 1920s. When Einstein heard the universe is expanding, he said, well, wait a second. If the universe is expanding, I don't need to balance everything exactly, because all that gravity is going to do is going to slow down the expansion. Yes, in the same way that, you know, I, I throw my keys up here, and uh, the, the gravity of the Earth just slows the keys down. It, I don't need to balance all the forces, right? So he took the term out of his equation and regretted having ever putting it in there. Now, there is a big, again, history of science question of whether he actually called it his biggest blunder or not. I mean, let me just tell you that after a lot of research, I spent probably much more time on this than I should have had, but my conclusion is that he never used this term. This term was invented by George Gamow, another great physicist, but also who was known for embellishing his stories. My conclusion is Einstein never used the term uh, biggest blunder. Uh, this is a letter, by the way, from Einstein to Gamow. And uh, here, Gamow wrote at the bottom, of course, the old man agrees with almost anything nowadays. <laughs> um, uh, so anyhow, um, so I, I, I don't think he used the term. But, but there is no question, I, I, I want to make this clear, that he regretted having put this term in because he thought there was no need for it. And he also had some false idea of what it means to be an elegant theory and so on. He, let me maybe say a sentence about this. He, he thought that the elegance must be in the equations and when in fact the elegance has to be in the principles that underlie the theory and not in the form of the equation. The fact that you have an additive term is not in itself ugly. So anyhow. Um, now, what happened in 1998? In 1998, two groups of astronomers working independently discovered that the expansion of our universe is actually not only not slowing down, it's in fact speeding up. And three of them actually uh, you know, got the Nobel Prize for this discovery that the expansion of our universe is accelerating. So the universe at the beginning was uh, indeed decelerating under gravity, but some six billion years ago or so, it started accelerating and the expansion is really speeding up. And this was discovered mostly by the type of supernova explosions that many of the astronomers here at Weizmann are actually studying. Now, do you know what is driving this acceleration? As far as we can tell, at least to this day, what is driving the acceleration of the universe is that term that Einstein took out of his equations. <laughs> so not only was it not a mistake to put that term in, if there was a blunder, it was taking it out. 
because Einstein missed this way the opportunity to actually predict that the expansion of the universe should be accelerating. And the nature of the, that precise term is actually one of the biggest challenges that, that physics is facing today. So, you know, some people are so clever that even their blunders turn out to be great insights. Um, now, I, I want now to finish uh, by, you know, giving you the other main reason why I decided to write about this in the first place. And that's the following. When science and progress in science is described to the general public, to students, and so on, it is usually described as some sort of a pure success story. That progress is, progresses from A to B on a straight line. As I'm sure all of you know, nothing can be further from the truth. Uh, science progresses in a zigzag path with lots of false starts, many blind alleys, and lots of places where you have to go back to the beginning. Uh, you know, back to the drawing board, as we say, right? Uh, and, and so on. And I wanted this to be understood, but it's more than that. I noticed that in many, many of the processes that we see that are related to science, and indeed to creative processes in general, mistakes are greatly, greatly not encouraged. In fact, very much disfavored. And by that I mean starting from young students at school and continuing with funding agencies and so on in this. Now, let me make very clear what I'm saying here. I don't advocate sloppy mistakes or thoughtless mistakes. Every process should be thoughtful and very, very careful. But, you know, we always like to talk about thinking outside the box. Well, guess what? Thinking outside the box sometimes encounters blunders. If you think in unconventional ways, you actually may make mistakes. But those mistakes can lead to great things. Now, <laughs> like this. Uh, like, you know, the iPhone or whatever, yes? I mean, the thing is, at some level, maybe Israel is the last place where I need to say this because, you know, this is, after all, startup nation, right? So startup nation means, you know, most startup companies actually don't succeed. But a few of them succeed big time. You never can predict which one will succeed. If somebody asked me 30 years ago, you know, do you know what the world really needs? Is a mechanism by which to send 140 characters you know, that everybody can read. I'd say, what? Who needs that? You know, and so on. Well, that's Twitter, you know, so, which is a big thing today. Now, for how long it will be a big thing, we don't know, but it's, right now it's a big thing. So anyhow, my point is the following. I want to encourage what I call brilliant blunders. I, I actually wrote a paper for Nature just on this. Uh, blunders that have the potential, namely, to be able to take calculated risks, but calculated risks that maybe will fail, but have the potential to get, get to great rewards. And I want to tell you something that we've done with Hubble, which unfortunately we stopped it now because of various reasons, but for more than 10 years we had this. See, every year more than 1,000 people propose to do observations with the Hubble Space Telescope. And the pressure of the proposals is very high. You know, on the average, maybe one in seven gets time and so on. But the time allocation committees for more than 10 years would, were encouraged to save about 10% of the telescope's time to proposals deemed risky. Namely, proposals where it wasn't clear whether they can actually reach the declared objectives. But where it was clear that if they do reach though, well, first of all, that they weren't sloppy, you, could, you, know, you couldn't tell whether they will work or not, and that if they were to reach their objectives, the reward 
could have been magnificent. So that's the thing I'm trying to encourage, this brilliant type of blunder. So just to finish, I'll say that scientific brilliant blunder, what I call brilliant blunders, can actually be uh, the portals to discovery. Thank you.